This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Lesson 2 for July 4 to 10, ready for teaching on July 11. Winsome Witnesses, the Power of Personal Testimony. Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 4. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we sometimes are lost for words and we can't speak the things which we need to. We sometimes find that telling others about you is just that little bit difficult. But this week, as we open your word, we pray that not only will your word speak to us, but your Holy Spirit will guide us to show us what we need to be like as we share your love and your future uh, with those about us. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Acts 4, verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Let's read that again, Acts chapter 4 and verse 20. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. There is unusual power in a personal testimony. When our hearts are warmed by Christ's love and we are changed by his grace, we have something significant to say about him. It is one thing to share what Jesus has done for someone else. It is quite another to share what he has done for us personally. It is difficult to argue against personal experience. People may debate your theology or your interpretation of a text or even scoff at religion in general. But when an individual can say, I once was hopeless, but now have hope, I was filled with guilt, but now have peace. I was purposeless, but now have purpose. Even sceptics are impacted by the power of the gospel. Although some people may experience sudden dramatic conversions like the Apostle Paul's on the Damascus Road, more often conversion occurs as a person has a growing recognition of the preciousness of Jesus, a deep appreciation for his amazing grace, and a supreme sense of gratitude for the salvation he freely offers. Christ radically refocuses our lives. It is this witness that the world so desperately needs and longs for. Sunday, July 5. Unlikely Witnesses. Question. Read Mark chapter 5, verses 15 to 20. Why do you think Jesus sent the man into Decapolis to witness to his family and friends, rather than nurturing him in his newfound faith by keeping him with himself? Let's read Mark 5, beginning at verse 15. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from their region. And when he got into the boat... He who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends, and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed, and began to proclaim it in Decapolis, all that Jesus had done for him. And all marvelled. The word decapolis comes from two words, deca meaning ten and polis meaning city. The region of decapolis was an area of ten cities along the shores of the Sea of Galilee in the first century. These cities were bound together by a common language and culture. The demoniac was known by many people in that region. He had struck fear into their hearts through his unpredictable violent behaviour. Jesus saw in him one who longed for something better, and so he miraculously delivered the man from the demons that tormented him. When the townspeople heard that Jesus had permitted the demons to possess the herd of swine, and that the swine had run over a cliff into the sea, 
they came out to see what was taking place. Mark's Gospel records in Mark 5.15, Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. The man was whole again, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. The essence of the Gospel is to restore people broken by sin to the wholeness for which Christ has created them. What better person to reach these ten cities of Decapolis than a transformed demoniac who could share his testimony with the entire region? Ellen G. White states it well in Desire of Ages, page 340. As witnesses for Christ, we are to tell what we know, what we ourselves have seen and heard and felt. If we have been following Jesus step by step, we shall have something right to the point to tell concerning the way in which he has led us. We can tell how we have tested his promise and found the promise true. We can bear witness to what we have known of the grace of Christ. This is the witness for which our Lord calls, and for want of which the world is perishing. End of quote. God often uses unlikely witnesses who are changed by His grace to make a difference in our world. And so to finish today, what's your own story? That is, your own conversion story. What do you tell others about how you came to faith? What can you offer someone unconverted who could benefit from the experience you can share? Monday, July 6, Proclaiming the Risen Christ It was early Sunday morning, and the two Marys hastily made their way to the tomb of Christ. They were not going to ask him for anything. What could a dead man possibly give them? The last time they saw him, his body was bloodied, bruised and broken. The scenes of the cross were deeply etched in their minds. Now they were simply doing their duty. Sorrowfully, they made their way to the tomb to embalm his body. The gloomy shadows of despondency engulfed their lives in the darkness of despair. The future was uncertain and offered little hope. When they arrived at the tomb, they were startled to find it empty. Matthew records the events of that resurrection morning in these words in Matthew 28 verses 5 and 6. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. The women were now overwhelmed with joy. Their dark clouds of sadness faded into the sunlight of the dawning of resurrection morning. Their night of sadness was over. Gladness graced their countenances, and songs of rejoicing replaced their tears of lament. Question. Read Mark chapter 16, verses 1 to 11. What was Mary's response when she discovered Christ had risen from the dead? Matthew 16, beginning at verse 1. Now, when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices, that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, They came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter, that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him, as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, 
for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. After Mary met the resurrected Christ, she ran to tell the story. Good news is for sharing. And she could not be silent. Christ was alive. His tomb was empty. And the world must know it. After we too meet the resurrected Christ along the highway of life, we too must run to tell the story, for good news is for sharing. How fascinating too that despite all the times Jesus had told them what would happen, that he would be killed and then resurrected, the disciples, those ones Jesus specifically chose, refused to believe Mary's testimony, as in verse 11 it read, And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Thus, if even Jesus' own disciples didn't immediately believe, we shouldn't be surprised if others don't immediately accept our words either. So to finish today, when was the last time you were rebuffed in your witness? How did you respond? And what have you learned from that experience? Tuesday, July 7, Changed Lives Make a Difference Acts 4 verse 13 reads, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marvelled, and they realised that they had been with Jesus. The New Testament church exploded in growth. There were 3,000 baptised on the day of Pentecost. We read that in Acts 2.41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptised, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Thousands more were added to the church in a few weeks later. Verse 4 of chapter 4 in Acts reads, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Soon the authorities recognised what was happening. These New Testament believers had been with Christ. Their lives were changed. They were transformed by His grace, and they could not keep silent. Question. Read Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 20. What happened here? What happened when the authorities tried to silence Peter and John? What was their response? Acts 4, beginning at verse 1, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about five thousand. And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone." 
nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which you must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marvelled, and they realised that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing about it. But, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in his name. So, They called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. These believers were new in Christ, and they had to tell their story. Peter, a loud-mouthed fisherman, was transformed by the grace of God. James and John, the sons of thunder, who had difficulty controlling their tempers, were transformed by the grace of God. Thomas the skeptic was transformed by the grace of God. The disciples and members of the early church each had their own stories to tell, and they could not keep silence. Notice this powerful statement by Ellen G. White in the book Steps to Christ, page 78. No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. End of quote. Notice too what the religious leaders said in Acts 4 verse 16. What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. They openly acknowledged the reality of the miracle that had been performed. The healed man was standing right before them. Even with all this, they refused to change their attitude. And yet, Despite this open defiance, Peter and John were not going to back down from their witness. So to finish the day, what relationship is there between knowing Christ and sharing Christ? Why is knowing Christ personally so essential to our being able to witness about him? Wednesday, July 8, Sharing Our Experience In Acts chapter 26, we find the Apostle Paul standing as a prisoner before King Agrippa. Here, speaking directly to the king, Paul gave his own personal testimony. He talked about his life, not only as a persecutor of Jesus' followers, but also after his conversion, of his life as a witness to Jesus, and about the promise of the resurrection of the dead. Let's read verse 8 of chapter 26. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead, he said. When Paul was converted on the Damascus road, our Lord spoke to him and said in chapter 26 verse 16, I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. Sharing our faith is always a dynamic experience. It is telling the story of what Christ has done for us in the past, what he is doing in our lives today, and what he will accomplish for us in the future. Witnessing is never about us. It is always about Him. 
He is the God who forgives our iniquities, heals our diseases, crowns us with loving kindness, and satisfies us with good things, as we read in Psalm 103, 3 to 5, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Witnessing is simply sharing our story of His amazing grace. It is a testimony of our personal encounter with this God of amazing grace. Question, read 1 John 1 verses 1 to 3 and compare it with Galatians 2.20. What similarities do you see? How is John's experience similar to Paul's? 1 John 1 Verses 1 to 3, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me. Although John and Paul had different life experiences, they both had a personal encounter with Jesus. Their experiences with Jesus were not ones that occurred at a particular point in the past and was then over. It was an ongoing daily experience of rejoicing in his love and walking in the light of his truth. Is conversion ever a thing of the past alone? Look at Ellen White's statement about those who thought their past conversion experience is all that matters. It comes from Manuscript Releases, Volume 4, page 46. As if, if they knew something about religion once, they did not need to be converted daily. But we ought every day, every one of us, to be converted. End of quote. And so to finish the day. Regardless of whatever your past experiences have been, even if they were powerful and dramatic, why is it important to have a relationship with the Lord day by day, to sense His reality and His goodness and power day by day? Bring your answer to class on Sabbath. Thursday, July 9, The Power of a Personal Testimony Let's look again at Paul before Agrippa. The Apostle Paul stands before this man, the last in the line of Jewish kings, the Maccabees, and of the house of Herod. Agrippa professed to be a Jew, but at heart he was a Roman. There are comments in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 436, if you have access to that. The aged apostle, weary from his missionary journeys and battle-scarred in the conflict between good and evil, stands there, his heart filled with God's love and his face radiant with God's goodness. Whatever has happened in his life, whatever persecutions and difficulties he has experienced, he can declare that God is good. Agrippa is cynical, sceptical, hardened, and really indifferent to any genuine value system. In contrast, Paul is filled with faith, committed to the truth, and stalwart in defence of righteousness. The contrast between the two men could not be much more evident. At this trial, Paul requests to speak and receives permission from Agrippa. Question. Read Acts chapter 26, verses 1 to 32. How does Paul witness to Agrippa? What can we learn from his words? Acts 26, beginning at verse 1. 
Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation in Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first. If they were willing to testify that, according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities." While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen, and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people, as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other thing that, than these which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made his defence, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today, might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them, and when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Kindness opens hearts where abrasiveness closes them. 
Paul is incredibly gracious to Agrippa here. He calls him an expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. That's in verse 3. He then launches into a discussion of his conversion. Question, read Paul's conversion story in Acts 26, 12 to 18, and then carefully notice its effect on Agrippa in verses 26 to 28. Why do you think Agrippa reacted the way he did? What impressed him about Paul's testimony? Verses 12 to 18. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground... I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. And then Agrippa's response beginning in verse 26. For the king before whom I also speak freely, knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You almost persuade me to become a Christian. Paul's testimony on how Jesus changed his life had a powerful impact on a godless king. There is no witness as effective as a changed life. The witness of a life genuinely converted has an amazing influence on others. Even godless kings are moved by lives transformed by grace. Even if we don't have as dramatic a story as Paul, we all should be able to tell others about what it means to know Jesus and to be redeemed by his blood. Friday, July 10. The essence of the Christian life is a relationship with Jesus that is so rich and full that we long to share it. As important as correct doctrine is, it cannot substitute for a life transformed by grace and changed by love. Ellen White makes it plain when she states in the Acts of the Apostles, page 31, the Saviour knew that no argument, however logical, would melt hard hearts or break through the crust of worldliness and selfishness. He knew that his disciples must receive the heavenly endowment, that the gospel would be effective only as it was proclaimed by hearts made warm and lips made eloquent by a living knowledge of him who is the way, the truth and the life. In the book Desire of Ages, she adds this powerful thought on page 826. The wonderful love of Christ will melt and subdue hearts when the mere reiteration of doctrines would accomplish nothing. End of quote. There are those who have the idea that giving their personal testimony is about trying to convince others of the truths they have discovered in the Word of God. Although it is important at the appropriate time to share the truths of God's word, our personal testimony has much more to do with the freedom from guilt, the peace, the mercy, the forgiveness, and the strength, hope, and joy we have found in the gift of eternal life Jesus so freely offers. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. One, why do you think your personal testimony is so important in influencing others? How have the testimonies of others impacted you and your own experience? 
to, in class, talk about your answer to Wednesday's final question. Why is a daily experience with the Lord so important, not just to our witness, but to our own personal faith as well? 3. Of course, a powerful testimony can be an effective witness. At the same time, why is a godly life such an important part of our witness? 4. Share your personal testimony with the class. Remember that you are sharing what Christ has done for you and what he means to you. What difference does Jesus make in your life? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Reviving an Ohio Church and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Financial planner Vince Wan credits the Holy Spirit and a pipe organ for transforming a declining church of 15 people into a vibrant congregation of about 85 in three years in the United States state of Ohio. The miracle started when Vince preached at various small churches, including at the Hamilton Seventh-day Adventist Church, where he had worshipped as a child. Attendance had really fallen off, Vince said. There was no one to play the piano. My wife sang special music with a CD. One evening, his wife Darla returned from a bridal shower at the Hamilton Church and announced that the church pastor was leaving. You could be their pastor, she said jokingly. For the next two weeks, Vince couldn't forget the church. He awoke at night with his wife's words ringing in his ears. You could be the pastor. Finally, Vince volunteered to assist the Hamilton Church for six months. The next thing he knew, the Hamilton Church's six board members told him that they had been praying for him to be their lay pastor. Those prayers had gone on for the two weeks that I had been waking up in the middle of the night, Vince said. It was definitely the Holy Spirit working. In the new role, Vince invited a retired professional organist, Jerry Taylor, to assist as music director. One day, Jerry excitedly called Vince to say an upscale retirement community in Cincinnati was selling a pipe organ for $75,000. We can't afford that, Vince said. Even $5,000 would be too much. Let's go look at it anyway, Jerry said. The retirement community's chaplain was fascinated to hear about the Hamilton Church. He excused himself for a moment and returning said, I spoke with the director just now. We have been looking for a church to donate this pipe organ to. The only requirement is to open the doors to the community. The Hamilton Church received the pipe organ for free. The miracles continued. Construction workers remodelled the sanctuary for the pipe organ at cost. Engineers helped the church, whose cistern-drawn water was undrinkable, connect to the city water supply. Christians from many denominations joined the church's new choir. A thrilling moment came when two women walked into the church on a Sabbath morning and announced that they wanted to keep the biblical Sabbath after studying the Bible on their own. One woman and her husband were later baptised. The pipe organ, however, appears to be the main instrument that God has used to attract people to church, said Vince Wan, 65. We are just drawing in the people, he said, and there's a photo of him here with part of the organ. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.